Welcome back to Face the Nation. I'm Margaret Brennan. For some analysis on the situation surrounding this upcoming North Korea summit, we want to bring in Sumi Terry, who is with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and Jean Lee, the former bureau chief in North Korea for the Associated Press. She is now with the Wilson Center here in Washington. Welcome to the show. It sounds like we are seeing the diplomacy build just in the past few hours, American diplomats meeting with North Koreans to hammer out whether or not this summit is actually going to happen. What do we read into this? Is this a sure thing at this point that President Trump and Kim meet June 12th? I think it's highly likely because clearly President Trump wants this meeting. Kim Jong-un definitely wants this meeting. You can tell by the last statement that North Korea released, which was very conciliatory in tone for North Korean standards, personally praising Trump. Uh, himself, and I've never seen it as a North Korea watcher. I've not, I've not seen North Korea actually praising a U.S. president. So I think both sides have true incentive to sit down, and I don't know if it's going to be June 12th, but I think it's going to happen. It was interesting to hear uh, former Director Clapper say he actually thought that this was good strategy, that letter that President Trump sent this week calling off the summit. Gene, is it? I mean, does this look like it's actually going to deliver what the president was asking for? There's been so much uncertainty over the past week, and I think that what this past week has done is inject a bit of a reality check in this situation and forced all the partners in this uh, circle to reinforce their commitment. And we're getting that. We're seeing that commitment from North Korea and South Korea. And now we have U.S. officials on the North Korean side of the DMZ, and there's no more concrete sign that this is going forward than having that group of, that team of three, as reported by the Washington Post, sitting down with the North Koreans to hammer out those details. It looks like the nuts and bolts are still being worked out, Sumi, but we did hear from South Korea's president that Kim Jong-un wants more definite security assurances. What do you get that's more definite than President Trump saying, we're, we're not looking for regime change? Well, North Korea is not going to trust our words, and I'm not even sure if a piece of paper is going to guarantee regime security. What North Koreans meant traditionally by regime security is end of U.S.-South Korea alliance. They usually talked about troop presence in South Korea, U.S. troop presence in South Korea. I'm not sure if North Korea is going to demand that, but what they're looking for is a peace treaty, normalization of relations between Pyongyang and Washington. Now, you spent a number of years at the CIA on this portfolio. We're now seeing American diplomats in the driver's seat. Uh, veteran uh, diplomat today, Sung Kim, meeting with the North Koreans. What does that say to you? What changes now that we move from intelligence to diplomacy? Well, I'm not sure if intelligence is completely cut off. Um, I'm sure just Sung Kim has been brought on because he has experience of dealing with North Koreans. But I think what he will be seeking for is clarity on denuclearization, because we are, we've been talking about how there's a different definition of denuclearization. Uh, so far from North Korea and Washington, we are talking about unilateral disarmament of North Korea's nuclear weapons program. North Korea always talked about it in a broader sense of the Korean Peninsula. So I'm sure he's looking for clarity to make sure that when Trump sits down with Kim Jong-un, we have not as a wide gap that we had before. Jean, you lived in Pyongyang for some time uh, while you were bureau chief there. Did it surprise you when you heard North Korea outright reject these offers of financial help from the United States, private investment, as Secretary Pompeo described it? I think that is a face-saving way to, uh, they were insulted by these suggestions by the National Security Advisor and by the Vice President that they are doing this out of desperation. North Korea does not want to be portrayed as a poor, desperate country. They're saying, listen, we have a nuclear arsenal, a verifiable nuclear arsenal. We want to come to this meeting as an equal. And so it was a way to tell their people as well, you can maintain your sense of pride. But I do think they're going to be looking for economic uh, concessions. And I think President Moon is the one who stated that language very carefully, said economic cooperation. And that is perhaps the language that you use when you talk about it with the North Koreans. What you're saying is the rhetoric and the words chosen here really matter. And Precisely. we've seen the, diploma, the, the rhetoric at different points in the White House timetable and look very different depending on who it's coming from, Pompeo versus National Security Advisor Bolton. But even Pompeo, when he said, North Korea, you too can eat meat. Uh, it, I think that was a very insulting phrase. You too, North Korea, can become like South Korea if you denuclearize. And of course, because Kim Jong-un is very into face, he's thin-skinned person, he cares very much about how he's perceived. So I think that 
rhetoric does matter. How we send this message does matter very much. So in the messaging that you've seen from President Trump, he seems very eager to have this summit happen. But he is not someone who sticks to a diplomatic script. You're saying that has where it's worked against him. Has it been in his favor in some ways to be this unpredictable? Well, I think the last... When, when President Trump canceled the summit, I think that did take North Koreans by surprise. I don't think North Koreans are used to U.S. president acting this way. So that kind of unpredictability, I do think, sent a message to North Korea that they have to be careful here, too, because we are, we are dealing with unpredictability on both sides. But the North Koreans all along have used his unpredictability as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think when he was campaigning for president and he said back then that he would sit down with Kim Jong-un, that the North Koreans paid attention to that. And they said, here is a president for the first time who is not playing by the book, and let's take advantage of that. Let's grab this mm -hmm. opportunity. North Korea has multiple nuclear sites, according to U.S. intelligence, some of them underground. The fact that they blew up this one site and invited in reporters, is this a typical script? Is this theater? What do we make of this? We've seen this before, and that's important to keep in mind. It was 10 years ago when North Korea brought foreign journalists to its nuclear site in Yongbyon and blew up a cooling tower, very dramatic images, and then, of course, secretly started enriching uranium. And so it is show, it is theater, but it's also meant as a sign, an expression of their commitment to denuclearization, and they will use that to say, look, look what we've done. We want to show you, we have proof that we're committed to this. So I think it's a long way to go before we get yeah. to a complete irreversible uh, dismantlement of North Korea's nuclear program, uh, because it is still reversible. And you're talking about tunnels. They, North Korea has hundreds of thousands of underground tunnels. So a verifiable part mm -hmm. is going to be the very challenging issue for us. Thank you both very much. We'll be right back with the head of the conservative House Freedom Caucus, Mark Meadows. Stay with us. We're back with one of the president's biggest supporters in the House, Congressman Mark Meadows. Thanks for joining us. It's great to be with you. Thanks so much. Uh, we were just talking to Director Clapper about uh, what the president calls Spygate. Right. Um, you've had a lot of questions about this. We saw the Justice Department hold this extraordinary briefing with leadership on the Hill showing some classified materials. I know you weren't in those meetings, but tell me if you're satisfied. Well, I... To be clear, no documents were shown. And so there was a briefing, but yet there were no documents that were shown. We're hopeful that that will happen in the coming days as long as we can protect the sources and methods that are important to all Americans. And yet at the same time, we continue to see this dragging out of a narrative, you know, uh, where we're not seeing documents, where we're not getting the type of transparency that really members of Congress have requested for seven or eight months. What and do so, you think the FBI did, and, and who do you think they Well, did I mean, to? what we do know is, is that there was indeed a confidential human source, is, is what the FBI would call it, uh, that was, was actually giving intel, not only to the FBI, but you have to ask the question, uh, w when did it start? We do know that actually those confidential human sources were engaging prior to the official <laughs> FBI investigation. So the question begs, at whose direction, you know, what were they collecting and who were they reporting to? Because that was happening before the FBI actually opened an investigation. And so as we know that, and we know that from non-classified sources, uh, there is no question that there was a spy that was collecting information. And the definition of that, somebody who does something in secret without the, uh, the knowledge of another person. But, you know, in, in legal standards, that's different in terms of how law enforcement works with informants. Well, but an informant is someone who, if, if they had information on you and went to the FBI and said, you know, listen, we have this wrongdoing. We're giving you some information uh, where it was not directed or where the, the initiation of it was not from the informant. We, we know that actually they initiated the contact between members of the Trump campaign and at whose direction. And, and at what point do we as Americans say it is not right to spy on a campaign? Whether it's Donald Trump's or Bernie Sanders, it's not right. 
Well, the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, Senator Rubio, who was on this show, said they haven't seen evidence to, to back up the claim well, that I'd there be was glad, someone spying. You know, listen, I've got non-classified stuff, Margaret, and if they want to come by my office, mm -hmm. Senator Rubio is a dear friend. He can come by. We've got, you know, text messages that acknowledge the existence of that. Well, and if you so, had people around your campaign or in your office who right. were being contacted or trying to make contact with foreign powers, would you want that looked into? Sure, and sure but they're, they're in as another problem. If the FBI I knew it was going on, why did they not do a defensive briefing? Why did they not go to uh, the, the nominee and say, by the way, here is a problem. You've got somebody that you've never met, Carter Page, who had never met the president, that is having inappropriate uh, contact with someone. We want to make you aware of it. Why was that never done? And it still to this date has never been done. I want to ask you as well about immigration. Sure. We could talk all day about yeah. the other topic. Uh, the president tweeted yesterday that it's a horrible law to have parents separated from their children if they right. cross the border illegally. Yeah. Do you yeah. agree it's horrible? Yeah, I think it is a horrible law. It's, it's, it's one of those that actually, actually, I think we there is real bipartisan support for changing that. Here's one of the interesting things. As we've been in these negotiations on trying to fix the immigration problem, uh, this came out just the other day, and I said, well, I can't imagine that it's the law that you have to separate these individuals. Now, obviously, human trafficking is a big deal. You know, How do you know that they're really the parents in a family unit? Uh, so we would have to address that. But I think conservatives and moderates, Democrats and Republicans all agree that keeping a family together is the best strategy and it's something we, uh, we need to address and will address. Do you see this as part of other immigration reform? Because we've seen this week the GOP sort of fighting within itself over the direction to yeah, take, we're, particularly we're, with status. Yeah, and, and we're very close uh, on, on that. Uh, I, I can tell a you... A path to citizenship uh, well, or and even to even status. making sure that those DACA recipients do not have to face deportation and that ultimately... Uh, they can become citizens. Now, the, the debate becomes over, should there be a special pathway? Should they go to the back of the line? Should they go to the front of the line? And, and obviously, those are things that we have to negotiate on. Do you have an opinion on uh, that? You know, I, I don't think that someone who comes here illegally should get to go to the front of the line. Uh, at the same time, uh, as we deal with this, it, it's an emotional topic. My district is very different from some of my other moderate friends. Uh, and yet we're having real conversations within the last 48 hours on trying to get a resolution. The president wants some the Some kind of status, but not yeah. citizenship. Well, no, say. it's not even that. I think that even in some of the more conservative bills that have been talked about, there is the ability to become citizens. And so that's the narrative that's not really out there. And so it's, it's important that we look at all of that. The most important thing is to secure our southern border so that we don't have to deal with this problem a decade from now, two decades from now. And I think that's we're, we're well on our way to doing that. Congressman, thank uh, you very thank much you. for thank joining you. us. We'll be back in a moment with our political panel. It's time now for some political analysis. Mark Landler is a White House correspondent at The New York Times. Susan Glasser has a new job since the last time we saw her. She now writes the column Trump's Washington for The New Yorker. Ramesh Panuru is a senior editor at The National Review, a columnist for Bloomberg View, and a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And Paula Reed is the CBS News correspondent who covers the Justice Department, the FBI, as well as the White House and anything else we throw at her. Paula, let's start with you on that theme. What the president calls Spygate, what we have talked about on this show so far, we have heard that there has been nothing new learned from these extraordinary briefings that happened on Capitol Hill this week with DOJ meeting with Republican and Democratic leaders to talk about what happened during the campaign and this probe. What more is there to learn? Because Congressman Meadows says they're about to present new documents. That was news to me because no one in the Justice Department has ever mentioned the fact that there could be another meeting. But really, there's always another meeting. They've been doing this for months now, right? Devin Nunes will find something, some question about the origins of the Mueller probe. He'll make a lot of noise. And usually the Justice Department will eventually agree to some sort of meeting, discuss a document, even if they don't hand it over. It goes quiet, and then a few weeks later, the same thing. And again, this was an extraordinary set of meetings because here the president threatened 
to order the Justice Department to open an investigation. And in exchange, he got a meeting with his top justice officials. He got them to sit down um, with his allies in Congress. And also he got Rod Rosenstein, the Deputy Attorney General, to agree to ask the Office of Inspector General to investigate this question. So that's a pretty successful week, also messaging the Spygate, because everyone's talking about Spygate. No one's talking about why several campaign officials had suspicious contact with Russians, and at least two of them have pleaded guilty in the Russia probe. Congressman Meadows, who was just with us, had at one point been drafting articles of impeachment to get rid of Rod Rosenstein, who you just talked about. Uh, is that how Americans should understand this, that it's a, it's a political move, or is this something more. I mean, people hear Spygate and they do think there's something more to this story. Well, two things. First of all, there's absolutely a desire to undermine the outcome of the Mueller probe. And one of the things that they were trying to do at some one point was possibly fire the deputy attorney general. And that is sort of presented itself as not politically feasible. So it does appear that this most recent wave of demands for documents that they know the Justice Department would be hard pressed to be able to disclose is sort of pretext to try to pursue this idea of impeaching Rod Rosenstein. But politically and legally, that's probably not actually realistic. Mark Landler, I want to give you a chance to respond to uh, the president's tweets, because they have been about your story that you co-wrote with our, your colleague David Sanger, where he is calling into question some of your White House sources and whether they exist. Well, thank you, Margaret. Um, the president tweeted yesterday that we, in a sense, in, in essence, made up a source. Uh, and the, the issue uh, at question was, would the president be ready to go to Singapore for a June 12th summit with Kim Jong-un? Um, last week, uh, on the day the president pulled out, when he sent his letter to Chairman Kim, uh, there was a background briefing held at the White House in the briefing room, a senior official briefed from the podium, and was asked that question. And the answer he gave was, we have lost a lot of time, there's a lot of work to be done, June 12th is 10 minutes from now. And I wrote uh, that this official basically was saying it was impossible to prepare properly for a meeting on June 12th. So the president, uh, you know, tweeted that this person doesn't exist. Well, he not only exists, he works for the president. Uh, so I think there's two issues. W one, the obvious issue, the president either doesn't know or doesn't care what other members of his administration are saying. I do think it raises a valid question about the whole notion of background briefings. These are a very well-entrenched Washington custom where you go listen to an official and you don't quote that official by name. We've had long had debates about this internally. At this meeting, as at most other background sessions, a reporter did say, can we put this on the record? The White House said no. But if you were to hold these meetings on the record or insist on that, there would be far more accountability and you wouldn't necessarily have this kind of strange back and forth that we've had this weekend. And, and it has been a strange one. Susan, the North Korea summit, mm -hmm. uh, you wrote the president is more of a deal breaker than a deal maker in your piece this week. Now the summit may be happening, after all. Well, that's right, and it may well be happening. I think that's important for everybody to note, uh, right? President Trump has signaled that he is very committed to it. Arguably, his tweet about Mark's story was actually because there is an internal division inside the president's administration. And I think one takeaway from all of this, right, is that nobody speaks for the president. And uh, he has wanted it that way. Arguably, uh, he has turned the United States for the first time in any of our memory into sort of the epicenter of global instability, because it's clear that in the end, decisions are being made by one man. And even if his top advisors say it's not really feasible to have a summit on June 12th, if he wants to have it, it may well go ahead. The broader point however, I think really still stands, which is if you pull back 16 months into the Trump presidency, uh, we know that it's a lot easier for President Trump to pull out of deals, to break deals, than it is to make them. Remember when he said that, uh, you know, maybe this whole Middle East peace thing will turn out to be a lot easier than anybody thought? Well, of course, we're still, still waiting for them even to, to put out a plan. And uh, not to make light of it, of course it's a complicated issue. Uh, you still have the president, whether it's on issues like NAFTA or domestic policy issues like Obamacare, uh, infrastructure, famous infrastructure week every, every week now in Washington is infrastructure week, struggling for very understandable reasons often uh, to deal with entrenched politics. Uh, on the world stage, I think President Trump has shown that he is a newcomer, that he is not deeply uh, immersed in the policy issues. And I think 
the drama over the summit, it's easier to talk about whether there's going to be a meeting on June 12th or not. The underlying issue of whether North Korea will give up mm -hmm. nuclear weapons that have been at the foundation of the country's national security for three generations of the Kim family, it's still very hard to see that happening. Ramesh, is there a deal to be struck on immigration? Well, you know, I do think that the moment what, that was most propitious for a deal passed us by several months ago. I think there was an opportunity to have the Democrats, the Democrats agree to a wall or at least some kind of border security and the Republicans to agree to some kind of an amnesty for illegal immigrants who came here as minors. But for various reasons, that didn't happen. I think the president first encouraged the Democrats to think they didn't have to give up anything because he was saying so that he wanted a deal so badly. And then he came out with a list of demands, including cuts to legal immigration, that was just way too much for the political process to handle or for Democrats and even a lot of Republicans mm -hmm. to accept. Time's grown short. I think it's going to be harder to get that kind of deal. I think that, once again, as Susan was saying, the deal maker has not quite come through here. And Paula, on this issue of separating parents from their children when they cross illegally, you heard from both Senator Rubio and from Congressman Meadows that they're willing to move on this. They are, but the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, may not be willing to move on this. Look, if you can't get a wall, Attorney General Sessions is the next best thing in terms of deterring people from coming to this country. And while his relationship with the president may not be the best, he has been trying to manifest the president's campaign promises on immigration every moment of every day. Uh, he's looking at the immigration courts. Uh, not only is he staffing them up, he's giving judges quotas. He's moved from more of a civil proceeding to criminal prosecutions, and he has said publicly he is willing to separate families. So while other people may be, you know, willing to move on this, I don't think he is. And I also think if this works as a deterrent, a lot of the people who are criticizing him now will likely be taking credit for that mm -hmm. uh, come the midterms and future elections. And about those midterms, Ramesh, does the, the lack of deals hurt the president who sells himself as a deal maker for the party? Well, look, if you look at the polling, Republicans have been doing better over the last few months. The so-called generic ballot where people are polled on whether they want a Republican or a Democrat in Congress. That's been narrowing. It's been moving in the Republicans' favor. Even one poll had the Republicans up in it. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of congressional Republicans are, are feeling better about this than they were a few months ago. The problem they have, I think, is the intensity factor. Who's going to actually be motivated enough to show up to vote? Right now, I think it's pretty clear the Democrats are more motivated, as is usually the case yeah. during midterm elections. Well, we will uh, see. Opposition party. The, the opposition yeah, right. party, historically. Uh, we'll be right back. Thank you very much to all of you. That's it for us today. Thank you all for watching Face the Nation. On this Memorial Day weekend, we leave you with a tribute to those members of the U.S. military killed while stationed overseas in the last year.